You, what's up guys hope you guys are doing good. So today we are going to see what if Naruto was betrayed and returned after 4 year part 1. Hope you will enjoy this video so before we start please like the video and subscribe to our channel and hit bell notification it motivates me to upload more fanfics for my lovely audience. So let's get started. One 12 year old Uzumaki Naruto gasped in pain. His entire body was consumed in it. Not surprising given how his body had just endured an onslaught of Sinban needles made out of ice. Of course, the boy was no stranger to pain. Konoha, one of the five major shinobi villages he was from. Being the village's Jinchuriki, you learn what it means to feel pain on an emotional, physical, and mental level at a very young age. Being beaten, poisoned, stabbed, told you were worthless, had no loved ones, no one would miss you, and your parents if he had any was either a bastard man or whore for a woman. The academy from which he, learned, to be a shinobi was no better. Instructors would mock him, his dream of being Hokage, sabotaged his training, and overall development in being a shinobi. The various ninja weapons he bought at stores were of poor quality or those he, liberated, from trash cans. Still he endured. He was an Uzumaki after all and a member of the Uzumaki clan does not break no matter the circumstances thrown their way. Too bad no one from Konoha ever told him he actually came from a clan filled with those with Uzumaki blood. Now do you see loser? Your life was meant to be used to save me. Someone who has far more worth in his hand than you do in your entire body mocked Sasuke with a smirk on his face that Naruto couldn't see due to the Uchiha being behind him. Bastard, you used me as a human shield, exclaimed Naruto while Sasuke held him in place. Of course I did you pathetic idiot. Why wouldn't I? I'm an Uchiha, an elite. The elite are the strongest in the world. An elite like myself sacrifices the weaklings of the world like you so we don't have to risk getting ourselves hurt by the filth that have the audacity to oppose us. You are weak. You have no business living in this world any more than you have the right to stand near an elite like me, answered Sasuke while tightening his grip on Naruto. Says the guy who is afraid of being hit by a bunch of needles. If you were truly an elite, you would not be scared of a little pain countered Naruto and heard Sasuke growl at him in anger. Scared. You dare excuse an elite shinobi like myself of being scared. Let's see just how scared you are by throwing you into the water below. Exclaimed Sasuke before throwing Naruto out of the ice mirrors around them and over the bridge. Much to the shock of the fake hunter Nin that was Haku watching this event unfold. He was your comrade. Why would you betray him like that? demanded Haku with anger. Because I'm an Uchiha, and Uchiha can sacrifice anyone and everyone he wants to win a fight. It doesn't matter if they are friends with us. It doesn't matter if they trained with us for years. It doesn't matter if they are born from the same village as us. They are weak. They are all expendable. Everyone who is not an Uchiha is expendable, declared Sasuke while Haku frowned behind the mask. I see. And how exactly do you plan to beat me now that your human shield has been thrown away? Questioned Haku before readying more Sanban needles. Sasuke scowled at the question knowing he had unintentionally given into his anger and threw Naruto's body away too soon. Seeing the masked hunter Nin ready more of the needles in hand, the Uchiha grit his teeth further in anger and realized he may have been too hasty in his action of removing Naruto as his personal shield. With Naruto. Naruto was drowning. The impact from falling into the water at the height he was at when thrown had nearly made him blackout. His body was still filled with needles so movement, if it was possible, would have been at the bare minimum. Nowhere near enough to keep him afloat. As he sank to the bottom of the ocean floor, the blonde boy, and Jinchuriki thought about his life leading up to this point. And came to one single obvious conclusion, it sucked. He had been loyal to Konoha. Despite everything, he had put up with Konoha's abuse. Their sabotage of his education. 
Their mockery of his dream. His dream of being Hokage and showing everyone he was a somebody. But who was he kidding? His dream was a joke. Even Naruto knew it was a joke. He only held on to it because there was nothing else to hold on to when growing up. What else was there to hold on to? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The Hokage kept trying to tell him that being the leader of the village meant you the most important person in the village. That you had the respect and love the entire village because you were dependable when they needed you most and they would return it without asking. It was only now in the vast blue ocean and growing darkness did Naruto realize that just about everything regarding Konoha and being Hokage the Sandame told him was a lie. No doubt a means to keep the village Jinchuriki from doing something stupid or rash like running away from Konoha due to the abuse being unleashed on him. Is this truly it? Am I to die like this? Not saving those I care about, but drowning in the water at the hands of a backstabbing asshole I called a teammate. No. I want to live. I want to fight. I want. I want. I want revenge thought Naruto angrily while finding the darkness getting stronger. Only for his body to be covered in crimson chakra and he finally blacked out within seconds of it happening. Konoha four years later, a lone figure walked down the road to the gates of Konoha. His wooden sandals made, click clack, sounds as he walked. His clothing was black pants, shirt, a crimson trench coat with a large black spiral on the back, and a large straw hat a monk would wear on his head. His face was covered by black cloth, his eye covered by equally dark shades, but it was clear the eyes were far from normal, and the faint red glow behind them was a clear sign this man was not normal. Strapped to his waist in was an impressive katana. It was protected in a black sheath with crimson lining with the symbol of Uzu at the very top where the figure's thumb rested and almost caressed the symbol itself. As to why this figure was heading to Konoha, he had a wedding to crash. Halt. State your business. Commanded an emotionless Anbu standing guard at the gate. Is today the day of the wedding between Uchiha Sasuke and Hayuga Hanata? Asked the figure in a calm yet unreadable tone. It is. Why? Questioned the second Anbu while his hand flexed slightly to get it ready to reach for his sword. Oh good. I almost feared I was too late to attend. I take it everyone is there right now. Hence why I see no one walking the streets behind you, replied the figure with a hint of joy in his voice though for what purpose was unknown. It's by invitation only. Only the Hokage can give out such things to the most important of people. Present your invitation to us and you may pass, commanded the first Anbu. Ah yes. My invitation. Of course, silly me, here is my invitation right here, replied the figure softly while reaching into his shirt pocket for his invitation. Two seconds later both of the Anbu fell over dead due to a single kunai each embedding themselves into their temples. No sooner did that happen, another pair of Anbu wearing the spiral symbol headband swooped in and removed the dead bodies from sight. The figure put his hand out of his pocket and continued walking as if what just occurred mere moments ago did not just happen. All the while, an army of shadows moved into Konoha, taking out the various shinobi guarding, and hiding in the shadows to protect certain parts of the village. The smirk hidden behind the cloth on this mysterious man's face was the only thing proving that all was going according to plan so far with his entrance into the village. As the figure walked toward where the wedding was to be held, he gazed around Konoha to see the clearly empty streets. Not surprising since basically everyone within the village was attending the wedding. Everyone who was anyone from outside of Konoha was also here too. From the other four cages to the daimyos themselves were here to see this apparently, grand wedding, Konoha was throwing Uchiha, the biju killer, Sasuke. The young prodigy of a shinobi of Konoha, who apparently ended the life of the all-powerful Kayubi. Something not even the Yandaimi Hokage was able to do. They loved the boy for it after his return from Nami. A huge party was thrown in Sasuke's honor, 
The law the Sandame Hokage made for the boy holding the biju had repealed within the hour, and no one in Konoha seemed to care about how an innocent young genin in Jinchuriki died to make this miracle happen. Ha! Huh. If they only knew the truth of what really happened back in Nami all those years ago. The figure walking toward the wedding recalled how things had gone since traveling the world training, and wandering for the last four years through the elemental countries. Righting wrongs. Revealing treachery, deception, truth, and lies made by those in the shinobi world that do not want secrets brought into the light. During his time since his liberation, the figure had been busy using his power to fix several things that if left unchecked would have spelled doom for the world, and could even bring about in his mind. Dot the apocalypse. A scary thought to be sure and one that didn't need to happen if he could help it. Not that the human race didn't deserve to have the end of the world happen, but there were still plenty of people in the world who also didn't deserve to have the world end. Especially because of power-hungry assholes currently trying to unbalance the universe to becoming a king on top of a mountain made from lots and lots of dead people. Everyone in this village deserves to be wiped out. Why you save that ungrateful liar for a Sandame Hokage when facing off against Orochimaru all those years ago I will never understand. It put you at great personal risk at possibly being discovered far too soon, said a voice only the figure could hear within his head. You know the reason Kurama. No one is allowed to make the fools within this village be brought to their knees in despair and submission for the sins of the past. No one but me that is. Besides, my actions during the invasion here did far worse to the Sandame than Orochimaru ever could, thought the figure to the demon in his head known as Kurama while smirking at the memory. It had been months since that fateful day. Learning of Orochimaru's plans for Konoha during the Chunin exams. To kill the Sandame Hokage over the fact the man known as the professor had chosen Namikaze Minato over his favorite student. At first, the figure decided to do absolutely nothing, and let the Sanin have his revenge. Let Konoha burn to the ground at the hands of the Sandime's former student. Instant karma in a way due to the old man's inaction or inability to do what was right. Let one snake kill the other in hiding in monkey skin. However, that changed when the figure realized if he let the snake do this, it would ruin his own revenge against Konoha, and there were still some innocent people in the village who deserved mercy. A small minority of them mind you, but the last thing the figure wanted was to be like the Sandame Hokage in terms of letting the innocent suffer to make the guilty pay. All those days of training, planning, and preparing for the moment where he could get some measure of revenge, if only a prelude of the future that was to come led to the day when Orochimaru struck. Of course, the figure had a few allies of his own, and they set about dismantling the Sanin's plan before the day of the invasion. It wasn't hard. The main force attacking Konoha was in fact Suna, who had been an ally of village in the past, but were now on a decline, and felt this attack would show the might of their village to bring it back to the glory of years past. On the day of the attack, Suna was nowhere to be found among the invaders, much to Orochimaru's shock and displeasure when his sound nin were taken apart. His ace in the hole that was Suna's Jinchuriki Sabaku no Gara, who was supposed to be unstable, did not act like it on the day of the invasion, and was in fact much calmer than he had been since, ever. In fact, the red-haired boy had not only been calm during his fight with the hero, Uchiha Sasuke, but he trounced the brat for the majority of the fight, and was only stopped from killing the brat when Orochimaru signaled for the invasion to start. Of course, what no one outside of Suna's shinobi council, Gara, Gara's Junin sensei Baki, and Gara's siblings for teammates knew as they had been approached in the dead of night one week before the invasion by the mysterious figure. He had provided proof of their case cage being killed by Orochimaru and how the seal on Gara was in fact flawed to the point where it wouldn't even hold Shukaku back for another year if left alone as it was now. It wasn't surprising to them after the mysterious figure explained how the seal on Gara was never meant to hold back a biju at all. 
that the late Case Cage, in his own rushed attempt to make Suna strong, had decided to seal Shukaku into his youngest using a modified seal meant for the storage of large objects, and felt Shukaku met the criteria based on that one simple qualification. What the case cage or the one applying the seal failed to truly realize was Shukaku was not just a large object to be sealed, but a living, breathing entity, and one that would not stay silent if given the chance to be heard. The seal used on Gara would hold Shukaku for a time as was the initial design of it, but that was on the condition of the biju choosing not to move around so much. That the biju wouldn't try to move around in his cage to break free. The seal itself also lacked any kind of defense against Shukaku influencing Gara in terms of possession or speaking ill will based thoughts to the boy. Had such defense mechanisms been put in place, Gara would have indeed been the ideal Jinchuriki with a sound state of mind to go with his body. It also wouldn't have hurt if the poor boy had actually been loved over being constantly hated and seen as a monster like the case cage had people do. It took a few hours to carefully deal with Gara's seal, which Shukaku didn't want to be altered to hold him in an even tighter cage, but one look from beyond the shades made the biju go quiet in fear. Gara didn't understand it at first, but a simple nod from the figure made the red-haired boy nod in sudden understanding. By the time it was over, the seal was altered to properly contain a biju while still allowing Gara to keep his mastery over the sand in his gourd. When asked by the group why he was doing this, the figure revealed his face to them, and smiled at their shocked face while saying, what kind of person would I be if I didn't help a fellow brother in need? before vanishing into the shadows. As for the invasion, the figure moved through the shadows of the fighting, gathering the dark dirty secrets Konoha possessed, and there were quite a few of them. Not only that, but his allies also were in Konoha, and enacted another part of the plan to stop the Sanin from obtaining his victory. Namely, ruining his plan to summon the previous three Hokages to fight for him against the Sandame Hokage. In truth, the figure knew only two out of three previous Hokages would be summoned by Orochimaru due to the nature of how the Yandaimi died, and the Shinigami never willingly gave up what he took into his belly. As for the Shidaim and the Nadaim Hokage, they would have been summoned using the sacrifices Orochimaru had planned to use. Dot had a sudden intricate design of seals where the fighting took place glowed swarmed over the two objects, and set the coffins aflame in an ethereal golden fire. The next part was dealing with the Sanin's four bodyguards. Thanks to the intel that Suna had provided on the invasion plan, three of them were quickly killed off via seals underneath their feet exploding with the force of ten explosive tags. With them inside a small barrier within a barrier they ironically created to protect themselves, there was no chance of them escaping it, and died painful deaths as a result. The fourth one, a red-haired girl by the name of Tayuya, was hit with a seal filled with lightning that struck her body painfully, but not enough to kill her. It just knocked her out for the time being. Angry at having his plans ruined in such a humiliating fashion, Orochimaru tried to flee to gather what forces he had left, and figure out how everything around him fell apart. The Sandame moved to pursue him if not for a hidden seal he stepped on that exploded and sent him flying back with his leg being badly injured in the process. Given his old age and the injury itself, the man could no longer be Hokage, and would need to choose a successor. As for the Sanin, he had regrouped with Kabuto, and fled to Rice Country where one of his many bases were located throughout the world. But when they got there, the two were at a loss to see the place completely destroyed, and the cages holding experiments were empty. The lab area itself was destroyed, data lost, and the knowledge gained from years of work had now become unsalvageable. There were a few dead bodies lying around in various areas, namely the guards, and the mindless drones willing to die for their master. By the time Orochimaru and Kabuto had made their way to the heart of the base, it had been too late to realize a trap had been set, and the destruction was merely the bait to lure the two into it. If one were to see the destruction of the base form the outside, 
one would think it was an explosion worthy of Didera, the mad bomber of Iowa himself. With the Sanin in his right hand man now dead, the figure along with his allies moved on to other things for the next four years in moving through the shadows, getting stronger, and preparing for the confrontation that was to come. Word of the snake's death would soon spread through Jiraiya's spy network, which was something the figure wanted to happen, and send Konoha if not the entire elemental countries into a state of uncertain panic. To make all the cages, daimyos, even missing Nin, and just about anyone else in the shinobi world whisper to each other about who could have killed Orochimaru. As for Konoha itself, many were wondering what the hell was going on. Not with Zhu the invasion, but the how, the why, and who surrounding its failure. Orochimaru was a genius of almost unparalleled intellect and any plan created usually came about being perfect down to the last detail. So how was it the man's plan blew up, in some cases quite literally, in his face, and caused it to fall apart the moment since the start when the signal was given? It left many of the higher-ups baffled including the Sandame and Nara Shikaku. They could only conclude that an outside force had gotten wind of the attack and decided to intervene to sabotage it. Though why this outside force didn't reveal themselves to get a much-deserved thanks was another mystery to them and made a few people nervous. Suna was being tight-lipped on the issue since they felt revealing they were part of the original plan would just make things worse in terms of straining the alliance they still had. Besides, they had far bigger, and more important things to do like find a suitable case cage if only a temporary one. Not only that, but the wind daimyo suddenly being assassinated shortly after, and a new one taking his place meant showing the feudal lord they were still worthy of funding. Fortunately, it seemed the new wind daimyo had more sense than his predecessor, and was sending more funds to Suna to bring them back to their former strength. And Suna wasn't the only one going through changes either. Kiri had ended the civil war caused by the Jinchuriki for a Mazukage. The rebellion that was led against him by one Turumi may had won with the help of the returning Momochi Zabuza and Haku. In fact, it was due to the additional aid of some very mysterious, yet powerful figures that helped fight against the Mazukage. They even made sure Yagura was defeated before he could even use the biju inside of him. Though how that was the case was a mystery to many who saw the Jinchuriki of the Three Tails in such a subdued state. Zabuza, who had barely escaped with Haku after the incident on Nami, wanted to take the man's head, but the third party aiding the rebels wouldn't let him. When asked why, the figures produced a book, a journal written by the Mizukage during his time ruling over Kiri while one of the masked figures simply whispered, read it, to them before they vanished with Yagura in tow. Of course, upon reading it, everyone soon discovered the man they had been fighting, who also just so happened to be a Jinchuriki, and abused one as a child to boot, had been a puppet of another. Someone with the Sharingan eye from what was learned in the man's journal was controlling Yagura telling him to hate bloodline users, being cruel to everyone around him, and by nothing short of being a tyrant. When the influence from the eye that possessed Yagura was at its weakest, the man was able to write vague cryptic messages in them in the hopes this journal would one day be found, and reveal he was not the monster the history books would no doubt portray his actions. Some in Konoha first assumed it was Uchiha Itachi, who was the one responsible for such a thing, but that was shot down immediately by Jiraiya. He explained the Mizukage had been acting violent regarding bloodlines during his reign long before Itachi went rogue so it wasn't him. The only conclusion the Sanin could give them was there was someone out there with a Sharingan at his or her command. Possibly someone similar to Kakashi with his ire maybe even another Uchiha who wasn't around when Itachi killed the rest of the clan. Needless to say, it made a few people among the higher-ups very nervous for reasons they would not dare disclose. In terms of choosing a successor, the now former Sandame Hokage had nominated his second student Senju Tsunade for the position. Sadly, the woman was not in the village, and would have to be found by his third student Jiraiya. 
The man had been brought back earlier than expected by the elderly Hokage after hearing of Naruto's death and it had made the Toad Sanin quite angry. Not at the loss of his godson per se, but rather the loss of Kanaha's Jinchuriki, and weapon deterrent he was meant to train in the future. Not only that, but Jiraiya believed the boy was foretold to be the child of prophecy, and thus required his attention when the time was right. Only for the Uchiha brat to mess things up. Jiraiya had been angry over that fact. Sure, he knew Minato and Kashina entrusted him to watch over the boy when growing up should anything happen to them. But in the moment of truth to properly raise and care for Naruto to ensure he was actually loved, Jiraiya had essentially. Well, choked. He felt it was best to let his sensei deal with the brat and when the time was right, just appear before him in his usual way. Afterwards, he would feed Naruto some key pieces of info that would practically make the brat putty in his hands to mold to being a shinobi. In the end, Jiraiya would not only train one final student, but the boy would become a famous legend in the shinobi world he could properly mooch off of when retired like Kashina would never let him do with Minato if given the chance. Besides, why should he, the great and gallant Jiraiya of the Sanin, author of Ika Ika Paradise, Supreme Bachelor, and Super Pervert Extraordinaire be tied down raising a brat? Much less a Jinchuriki. In Jiraiya's mind, it didn't matter if the boy was Minato's son. His former student should have known better to entrust the kid to being raised by him. While he loved Minato like a son, the Sanin didn't believe a Jinchuriki, regardless of lineage should be given a free ride in life, and had to learn that not everything was all sunshine and rainbows. When Tsunade was eventually found, she wasn't in the best of moods. Far from it even more so when it came to seeing him. Apparently, someone or some unknown group had gotten in contact with her before he did. They also told her quite a few things about one Uzumaki Naruto and how he was treated before dying on a mission at the hands of the Uchiha teammate who used him as a human shield before throwing the boy over the bridge to die in a watery grave. It got even worse when this unknown individual or group told the woman how Konoha celebrated Naruto's death and hailed Sasuke a hero with the title, the Biju Killer, for his, effort, to remove the Kyubi. The fact the boy was Minato and Kushina's son only made Tsunade's anger grow. Being part Uzumaki herself on her grandmother Mito's side, the slug Sanin felt she had lost yet another person, and once again blamed Konoha for it. Tsunade was the daughter that Tsunade always wanted in life, just like Minato was the son Jiraiya always wanted, sand the lack of perversity the blonde man didn't have the toad sage tried to pass down before Kashina put a stop to that. The only difference was Tsunade would have been there for Kashina if she had known about the pregnancy, but no one had told her due to constantly traveling with Shizune during this time, and was practically unreachable. When word did finally reach her of Kushina's death during the pregnancy, Tsunade had been devastated in believing not only had the girl she saw as a daughter die, but so did the child, and was mourning for the loss of them both. Only to find out that not only was the child alive, but became a Jinchuriki, was abused by the village, killed by a traitorous Uchiha, and neither her former sensei nor teammate did anything to stop it. Jiraiya himself had tried to play things as a grieving godfather and convince her to come back as the next Hokage to make things right, so this wouldn't happen again under her rule. But Tsunade had told him to fuck off and said if he didn't leave her sight within the next two minutes, that she would literally beat him to death. Jiraiya had told her if she did that to him, it would make the woman a missing nin, and Shizun too by extension. He had played it off with him being humorous, but the veiled threat was clearly there in his eyes, and the man waited to see how Tsunade would handle it. And surprisingly, Tsunade reacted in a way he did not expect her to react. She punched him right out of the bar they were in, and followed up by kicking him quite literally out of the city they were in. When Jiraiya managed to recover and try to find Tsunade again, she was nowhere to be found, and even his spy network seemed unable to find her. 
When Jiraiya came back to deliver his report on the failed mission, his sensei had been less than pleased and had no choice but to make Tsunade a missing nin. It had been a very devastating blow to the Sandime's ego and legacy knowing that he had yet another student become a missing nin. To make matters worse, the fire daimyo had also been present, and was not pleased to hear the Sandime's choice at being Hokage not only refused the title, but chose to betray Konoha over some past history he wasn't aware of. It was at this point in time, Danzo saw a rare moment to manipulate things further with his hidden Sharingan eye, and used its power to influence the daimyo to make him the new Hokage. Much to Hiruzen's and Jiraiya's horror along with the rest of the clan heads in the room when it happened. Homura and Kaharu had agreed to it instantly, seeing the one they sided with on many occasions over the years become Hokage, and a chance to make Konoha the military powerhouse they wanted for years. Since then, Konoha had been anything but a bright light in a rather dark shinobi world. Quite the opposite in fact. While other places shined with light, Konoha grew darker with each passing day, and Danzo causing more problems for the world than he would ever be willing to admit. In fact, the Warhawk would never admit his actions over the years had caused Konoha problems, and the increasing number of enemies with the number of high-level missions given to Konoha Shinobi. That wasn't how he saw things. Sadly, as far as Danzo was concerned, everything not a part of Konoha was an enemy, his enemy to be more precise, of the village, and needed to be either destroyed or enslaved. Once he became Hokage officially, Danzo ordered Root be brought back officially, and that one-third of all clans with the most potential be sent to the Root program to be given, proper conditioning, to be the elite shinobi among the village. Naturally, the clan heads outright refused the order, saying they had seen what Root does to their clansmen, and would not allow more of them become emotionless like all the other Root shinobi that Danzo had under his command. Danzo countered such an act was an act of treason, but Shikaku reminded him that it was against Kanaha's charter that clan heads must surrender so many of their members to an organization of Konoha. The Nara also reminded the new Hokage that it was also against the law, one of the few that even the Hokage himself could not change, or break since it stated clan members must volunteer willingly to join without any influence from outside forces. Naturally, it upset Danzo something fierce knowing there were laws in the village even he must yield to his Hokage despite his position. Regardless, the man made it his mission to make his ranks among Root swell with new recruits, and the most elite among them would be assigned to guard him. Not surprising when he got said recruits right from the orphanage or stole them from other places all throughout the elemental countries. It didn't matter if they were homeless or had families to call their own. In Donzo's eyes, if you were taken, then you belonged to Root, and thus belonged to him. As for his own position as Hokage, the man made it quite clear that his authority as Hokage was absolute when decisions were made for the good of Konoha, and the civilian council easily caved while the shinobi council were already behind him 100%. Indeed. Though his replacement is just as pathetic, if not more so with the way he is running this village. Hashirama must be rolling over in his grave while Madara is no doubt laughing at him for how far it's fallen, commented Kurama while the figure he lived in just nodded slightly. Well what did you expect Kurama? The man has been making a lot of enemies left and right without even considering the idea that his actions would only doom the village in the future. Besides, unknown to Danzo Tem, many of his past illegal activities have been exposed to the other shinobi villages, and the countries where he was taking children to turn into his emotionless pawns en route. His days at being Hokage are numbered and so are his supporters in what he's done since taking the hat, thought the figure while he got closer to his destination. I still can't believe the Uchiha is going to marry the Hyuga girl, who had a crush on you. It makes me sick at the idea of them being together, remarked Kurama while his vessel growled angrily. It's not official just yet Kurama. In fact, I intend to make this farce of a wedding go from white to bloody red very soon, 
thought the figure while Kurama let out a chuckle. To think, it only took your allies and long-lost family to make you realize just how much that girl cared about you. Of course, the way she beat the snot out of her cousin when he insulted you was also one for the history books, commented Kurama with the figure sighing with regret at so many wasted days spent chasing the other girl. After Uzumaki Naruto was reported dead, it had caused a major shift in emotions for one Hayuga Hanada. First, the news had nearly destroyed the shy girl. She locked herself in her room and didn't come out for two weeks. The poor girl would have stayed in there sooner had it not been for her sister, who unintentionally unleashed a fire in Hanada and had no intention of going out anytime soon. How did Hanabi do this? By insulting Naruto's memory. With the dead boy's secret now out for the village to know and some to twist to fit their point of views, Hanabi had no real problem insulting the boy like the elders often did. Besides, what was Hanada going to do? What was Hanabi's forever shy, timid, and ultimately spineless sister going to do to her younger sister she never won against in spars? The answer. Hanada snapped. She not only snapped, but rather went on a rampage by busting down her door, and proceeded to beat Hanabi almost within an inch of her life. It was as if Hanabi had unknowingly flipped the, on, switch to Hanada's anger and made the painful truth known to everyone that the girl could have beaten her younger sister in their spars at any time. The only reason she didn't was because Hanada was a kind, sweet, and gentle girl who didn't like fighting her family. Sadly, Naruto's death had in some way effectively caused the death of Hinata's gentle nature toward her family. Following that day, Hinata was no longer kind to any member of her family whether they were main or branch family. Why should she? The main family saw her as a weak little girl with no talent in gentle fist whatsoever. The branch family saw her in the same manner but also because such a weak Hyuga heiress would be unable to free them all from the traditions of the Hyuga clan main family enslaving them. After Naruto died though, they saw a transformation in the girl from sweet and gentle to cold and ruthless to anyone who upset her. Neji learned that the hard way in the Chunin exam preliminaries. He didn't believe that Hinata had changed that much despite what he heard happened to Hanabi. The boy had been away on a mission at the time when Hinata had exploded in a fit of rage so hearing it from another branch family member who witnessed the beating with fear made the prodigy skeptical. When it was his turn to fight Hinata in the preliminaries, the prodigy mocked Hinata and her anger over everyone who was insulting her crush's memory. He even went to say that fate decreed Naruto was weak and unworthy of living much less being a ninja of Konoha. That Uzumaki Naruto was simply fated to die a weak and pitiful excuse for a shinobi. In the end, Neji learned a very painful truth when fighting his cousin that day. Hayuga Hanada, when pissed off before a fight was a monster in human skin. Neji had lasted for barely five minutes into the fight before Hanada had crushed him into the ground and left him barely conscious. To make matters worse, Hinata publicly used the cage bird seal on his head and looked him dead in the eyes while doing it. After finally stopping before she caused any permanent damage, Hinata told Neji that her using the seal on his head could have been done at any time and to not embrace fate like it was the answer to life's questions. Well what did you expect? I was in a village where love was a foreign concept to me. I didn't know what the signs were of her liking me in such a way. My education wasn't what you call great you know. Thought the figure with Kurama nodding in agreement. Indeed. Though how this wedding came about baffles me. I thought this girl's father wanted a strong heiress to rule the clan in the future. Questioned Kurama while his vessel sighed again. He does. But Hinata has shown she is currently too strong to be controlled by anyone in the clan. Her own sister is afraid of her. It's why he helped arrange this marriage with the Uchiha in the belief the Tem would keep her in line, thought the figure while his mind went down a dark path to what he would do to the Uchiha if the asshole ever touched her. That fool for an Uchiha wouldn't last 10 seconds with her in any way. 
You have seen her from afar in secret and know for a fact the Hyuga vixen could beat the Uchiha easily in a fight. She most likely will kill him later today after they marry. Though why she doesn't fight this further stuns me. Not that it matters since the wedding is about to be crashed. Provided you do get there in time to protest the union, remarked Kurama knowing his vessel was keeping a close eye on Konoha during the last four years and knew the progress Hinata had made in that time. I agree with you on Hinata-chan's skill, but it's not that easy for her to fight this wedding Kurama. Not with Danzo Tem, Sasuke Tem, and Hiyashi Tem all agreeing to this in the hopes it will benefit them in some manner. Fortunately, I have quite a few tricks up my sleeve to nullify this, thought the figure with a smirk while Kurama did the same. How lucky you were that your mother and hers were good friends growing up to have an arranged marriage already set up between you. You must have the devil's luck in you. That's the only way I can see you being this lucky, remarked Kurama while the figure smiled further behind the cloth masking his face. Luck has nothing to do with it. Now if you will excuse me, I have a wedding to crash and an Uchiha to make bleed for his past sins, thought the figure before being stopped at the temple almost cathedral-like within Konoha where the wedding was to take place by two root nin standing guard. Halt. This place is forbidden to outsiders unless you have an invitation, stated a root nin in an emotionless tone. I am well aware of the wedding happening inside. That's why I am here, replied the figure with the pair of root nin glanced at his sword. Then you won't mind surrendering your sword and providing us with your invitation as proof of being invited, said the second root nin, who was clearly an Abarame judging by the way he was covered up, and wearing shades. Of course, let me see here, invitation, invitation, ah, here is my, invitation replied the figured before triggering the seal on the sheath of his sword and shot the weapon out like a bullet with the butt of the hilt hitting one of the root in the face in the nose. The impact of the force from the hit sent the cartilage and bone straight into the man's brain for an instant kill and slumped down dead on the ground. What th ack? exclaimed the second root nin before feeling a fist go right through his chest where the heart was located. It is well that you and your comrade are nothing more than mindless emotionless drones in the service of a crazed war hawk of a leader. The guilt of killing you and your master will weigh less heavily on my soul, remarked the figure before pulling his hand out and watching the body fall while flicking the blood off his now clawed hands. Only two guards. The fool isn't serious about protecting this place from the outside with just two emotionless guards questioned Kurama while the figure chuckled. Considering how we have been thinning out his ranks of root nin just the last year alone faster than he can replace them, I imagine most if not all of them are inside to protect the bastard. Considering all of the cages, their escorts, and even the daimyos with their own bodyguards are in there too, it's not surprising he would have them there watching them. The man is so paranoid people will try to kill him that his agents have agents assigned to kill them if given the order simply if they sneeze without being allowed to buy this guy, thought the figure while two masked shinobi with Uzu on them moved in and collected the downed bodies. Heading toward the door, the figure signaled for his agents in the shadows to take to the top of the temple and enter from there. After a second of waiting for them to do this, the mysterious figure opened the door slightly, and entered the large temple. Inside, he could hear people talk with anticipation about how the great, Biju killer, was going to marry the infamous Hyuga, Icy Heart, Hinata, and bring two great clans together. People from within and without of the village were in attendance, though not all of them seemed to be happy. Most of the rookies that graduated together didn't seem happy about this, as they knew Hanada did not love the Uchiha in the slightest. Some of the elite Junin sitting down in the room, who were the senseis of these rookies, also shared the angry mood of their former students. The only one who didn't was Kakashi, who was pleased to see at least one of his students live long enough to settle down and form a family with a girl. With Naruto dead for the last four years and Sakura being violently killed on a simple errand to deliver documents to the fire daimyo shortly after becoming Chunin two years ago, 
it made the one visibly eyed Junin believe Team 7 was in fact cursed. No one knew who killed Sakura or why it was done so violently. All they knew was the girl had died slowly, painfully, and the look of horror showing on what was left of her face with the one remaining eye dangled from its socket meant she knew the attacker. The fact the area where she was found indicated was a direct route to the fire country capital meant this person did not relocate her when they met. The lack of disturbance in the area around them also meant the two didn't fight right away, but rather talked for a time before something went south, and the attacker, judging by the one pair of sandal marks found beside Sakura's decided the time for talking was over. The blow had been hard on Kakashi, who had decided to train Sasuke even harder as the only remaining member of Team 7 left, and make the boy as strong as possible. He didn't believe Sasuke had sacrificed Naruto despite what happened in Nami. After Haku put the Uchiha in a fake death state, the fake hunter Nin had revealed just what the Uchiha had done before quickly taking Zabuza away before the Konoha Junin could kill him, and left Kakashi in a state of stupefaction until it was time to deal with Gato's army of thugs. It was a good thing the people of Nami had come together to form their own army otherwise a winded Kakashi along with his remaining students wouldn't have survived. After the fighting was over, it was discovered that Gato was killed when some idiot thugs accidentally elbowed the short man in the face during the fighting to protect him, and he fell off the bridge into the water below. If the fall didn't kill the man, the water soon would due to the impact no doubt breaking a bone here or there and the man already had his army broken by Haku at an earlier point in time. When Inari had asked where Naruto was, Tazuna had told everyone what happened since he heard what Haku had said, and while he didn't want to believe the words of a missing nin, there was just something about the masked shinobi that told the old bridge builder it was the truth. Needless to say, it brought about very mixed feelings on how to treat Team 7 following that little announcement. On one hand, they were happy Gato was no more. They were free from a tyrant that tried to drain them of life, happiness, and anything else they held dear. On the other hand, Uchiha Sasuke of Team 7 had betrayed his own teammate, their new hero, who had inspired them to rise up and fight Gato. To fight the tyrant and oppressor of their country. Not only that, but the pink-haired girl not only didn't believe it, but she was openly insulting Naruto for being a clumsy idiot, who she believed fell off the bridge after tripping on something. When Sasuke eventually regained consciousness, Kakashi had questioned him about it, and the Uchiha admitted to it with a smirk on his face like it was the best decision he had ever made. It didn't help that he said this with all the citizens of Nami hearing it. Kakashi had to take his two remaining students and flee the ever-growing mob of people upset that another hero had died for them at the hands of those the boy once trusted. It had caused a considerable amount of tension between Nami and Fire over the years, but nothing was ever truly resolved. Konoha refused to punish Sasuke and Nami refused to pay additional money owed for the mission jumping from sea to a in rank nor would they change the name of the bridge they had given it. The Uzumaki Naruto bridge was going to stay as it was come hell or high water in the minds of those in Nami. They would rather live under the oppressive rule of Gato again than rename it to have any connection to Uchiha Sasuke. I know what Sasuke did was wrong, but I can't just forsake him. It would be like I have forsaken Obito and the eye he gave me, thought Kakashi while glancing around at the people here and saw Jiraiya sitting next to him looking increasingly nervous. Like the man had a really bad feeling about this. The only time Kakashi knew the man felt such a thing was the day he decided to peep on Tsunade in the hot springs before she caught and beat him literally within an inch of his life. I shouldn't be here. I should be out of Konoha and using my spy network to find out who killed off the Akatsuki thought Jiraiya while feeling a sense of dread growing with each passing second. In the last two years, the Akatsuki had been running into one problem after the next, and all reports Jiraiya had gotten indicated it was mostly the work of just one man. 
A single figure with the mark of Uzu on the back of his trench coat and signifying he was in fact part of the long thought extinct or shattered Uzumaki clan. From what was known of the mysterious person, he would hunt down members of the Akatsuki and brutally murder them in plain sight in flash of crimson. Hence the name, Crimson Uzu, being the man's only form of identification thus far. The first to fall were Uchiha Itachi and Hoshigaki Kisame. They had been searching for the man or individuals who had been responsible for the death of Orochimaru. Having such a powerful person or people in the organization would have been a great boost to the group as a whole. Sadly, for the two members of the Akatsuki, Crimson Uzu was not in the mood to join the organization, and called them a bunch of power-hungry idiots who would turn on each other at the moment of truth if they ever did succeed in their plans. Kisame took that insult badly and moved to cut his now-declared opponent down with his trust Samahata, but found that to be impossible due to the speed of his enemy and the sword the enemy wielded. In his last moments of life, Kisame saw a sword like no other in the hands of his killer, and the power used in that single horizontal swing to kill him was a thing of beauty. The moment the sword left the sheath, Kisame saw his enemy's blade was crimson red in color, sparking with lightning, and actually created fire of all things when launched from the sheath in the process. This meant that when the blade cut right through the body, it automatically cauterized the flesh mere seconds after it was torn open. With his partner dead, Itachi felt his chances of winning his own fight to be uncertain, and moved to flee to report his findings to Pain. He would have succeeded if not for the fact he found himself unable to move before the thought occurred to him to move. How was this possible? The man had his feet up to his legs wrapped in chakra chains before they went to his arms and neck with the pointy tip of the chains going into the man's eyes straight to the brain. And that was all before Crimson Uzu had violently ripped apart Itachi's body from the waist on up. The only remains sent back to Konoha was a dried up hand, some hair, and single vial of blood with just enough to do one DNA scan to see if it was the Uchiha. Naturally, it pissed off Sasuke something fierce at having his one ambition denied, and he decided to have this one done now instead. Of course, Sasuke easily chose Hinata for this take, not only because she was strong, as she was much stronger than his fan girls or any other female around their age, but because Hinata loved and still loved Naruto more than anything. He wanted to stick it to Naruto from beyond the grave even further by marrying and having kids with possibly the only girl in Konoha that loved the pathetic idiot. The second pair of Akatsuki to fall were Didera and Sasori. They had been charged with getting Gara for the sealing of his biju into the statue and had attacked Suna. Only for them to be ambushed not just by Crimson Uzu, but others wearing the symbol of Uzu on their headbands. This helped spark rumors of Uzu and the Uzumaki clan itself being very much alive though no one from either Jiraiya's spy network or from Donzo's root could confirm this. The third pair of the Akatsuki to suddenly fall only a mere two weeks later were to the surprise of many, the infamous, zombie brothers, Kakuzu formerly from Taki, and the Jashin priest Hidan. Out of all the members of the Akatsuki, those two were said to be the closest one could get to being immortal with one having five hearts, and the other having made some deal with a deity to live forever in exchange for offering violent sacrifices in the form of people on a near daily basis. After that, the only remain members were Pain, Conan, Zetsu, and of course, Toby. It had bothered Jiraiya considerably when he heard about how AIM had suddenly been destroyed leaving just a massive crater where the village once stood. He had heard some rumors about the leader there possessing a powerful dojutsu and wondered if one or more of the orphans he trained in AIM for a time had been alive. If they were part of AIM. If they were a part of the Akatsuki. And if so, did they escape before AIM was destroyed? All Jiraiya had found when he personally went to investigate had been the decaying head of Zetsu and a shattered spiral mask rumored to belong to the one called Tobi. Oh will you calm down Jiraiya. You can go one day without peeping on women in the hot springs, 
commented Hirazan who was sitting right beside his former student with a cane in hand to support him now that his damaged leg was replaced by a prosthetic one from Suna thanks of the puppetry division. That's not why I am nervous sensei. I just feel as if something bad is going to happen. Like Tsunade is going to appear out of thin air and kill me like only a woman with her knowledge of the human body can. Jiraiya shot back at Hirazan while getting a feeling he was being watched at various angles by people. And not all of them were friendly. It wasn't long before everyone was eventually seated. An elderly fire monk from the fire temple at the altar where one Uchiha Sasuke stood in suit and tie with a smirk practically saying, victory is mine, on his face. It was clear the Uchiha was enjoying this way too much and was going to make sure to savor today well into tonight. Soon music started to play and everyone turned to stare at the beautiful woman wearing a white dress slowly moving down the aisle. And boy was she a woman of perfection, sans the scowl promising certain death to the groom she was about to marry currently on her face. I almost want to see this wedding happen, if only to watch it turn into the Uchiha's personal funeral the moment their marriage is made official by the monk. Almost, remarked Kurama with a grin on his face. I have something else in mind, thought the figure while listening the to the fire monk go on and on about love, devotion, and how these two symbolized opposite matches coming together and in great union. The fire monk wasn't entirely wrong. It was a match, made in hell. And an evil unholy union to boot. Ha. Huh. If these two should not be wed for any reason, please speak now or forever hold your peace, said the fire monk while no one expected to object though several people did want to since they knew Hanata wasn't doing this for love or devotion. This was forced upon her. It was about as opposite of love as you could get. I object to this wedding, marriage, and everything about this charade put together by greed people desiring power, replied the shadowy figure in the back. Naturally, there were loud gasps from shocked civilians. Growls of anger from certain shinobi in the room. All of which increased the moment the crimson Uzu made his appearance for all to see and was walking down the aisle calmly. Some Konoha shinobi in the room drew their weapons, Others moved to protect Danzo and the fire daimyo from harm. Who are you to deny me what is mine? Who are you to deny me? Uchiha Sasuke, the biju killer and future Hokage of Konoha, demanded Sasuke while a light chuckle left the form of Crimson Uzu as if the Uchiha had just told a joke. Biju killer, you, what biju did you kill exactly? You didn't kill the one tails, or two, or three, or four through six, and certainly not seven nor eight, remarked Crimson Uzu while Sasuke smirked. You forgot about the ninth. The Kaiubi. I killed it and its weak jailer. I am the greatest Uchiha since Madara and I did what no one has ever done before in the history of the ninja world. I killed the mightiest of the biju exclaimed Sasuke while his eyes were now in the form of the Sharingan and spinning wildly. I see, I can understand where you're coming from with such bragging rights. Such a feat would indeed make you the greatest of all the shinobi in the world. If it would be true, said Crimson Uzu with Sasuke looking livid and his supporters also looking quite angry at having the Uchiha being called a liar. It is true, I killed them both. I used that weakling Naruto as a shield against the enemy's projectiles in Nami and threw him off the bridge afterwards so he died a watery death. He should have been honored to help preserve my life. After all, he was nothing. Just a weak loser when compared to me. Declared Sasuke while Hinata was getting angrier with each passing second hearing this and was moments away from stabbing the Uchiha's heart to shut it down forever when a cold cruel laugh left Crimson Uzu's mouth. Now that is where you were wrong Uchiha Sasuke. You see, Uzumaki Naruto didn't die that day on the bridge at Nami. Oh no. In fact, he is very much alive. Declared Crimson Uzu while many gasped in shock horror, fear, and for some, dot joy. What? How do you know this? Who told you such things? 
demanded Sasuke while he looked ready to summon a Chidori and send it into the mystery man's chest any second. No one told me this, lie, Uchiha. As to how I know Uzumaki Naruto is alive, well he is standing here, right in front of you, replied Crimson Uzu before removing his cloth and straw hat to reveal the mature face of Uzumaki Naruto to the shock of everyone in the room. Naruto-kun, asked Hinata at seeing him after so long and felt her face heating up upon looking at the handsome face of the man she had a crush on. Hi Hinata-chan, sorry I made you cry after believing I was dead for so long. I hope you understand why I couldn't come back to Konoha when I was presumed dead. The people here showed their true colors when they heard of my demise at the hands of Sasuke Tem back in Nami. Not only that, but I had to keep training and to get stronger without having my potential being suppressed by the idiots running this village. Man, do I have quite the story to tell you later, replied Naruto with a kind smile that made the girl blush further. You won't be telling my future wife anything loser. Die, Chidori, exclaimed Sasuke before moving to stab Naruto with his lightning jutsu. Only for Naruto to easily dodge the strike, grab the arm, and broke it at the elbow before throwing the Uchiha down the aisle. Enraged, Sasuke instantly got up, and instantly had several medic moving to fix his arm. As this was happening, Danzo snapped his fingers, and had his roots around Naruto with weapons drawn. Uzumaki Naruto, for your desertion of this village and other crimes you have done since being born, as the current Hokage of Konoha, Ishimura Danzo, hereby order your arrest, and imprisonment for the remainder of your life. Or until a proper vessel can be found so we can extract the Kyubi from you and place the Biju into a new vessel, commanded Danzo with Naruto grinning evilly at him. Really? You want to play that card Danzo? I have enough dirt on you to start a one-sided shinobi war, remarked Naruto while Danzo frowned at him. You have nothing on me boy. Even if you did, I have full immunity from such things the moment I became Hokage replied Danzo with Naruto laughing at him. Not when you keep doing it after becoming Hokage. Besides, you only got that position using that Sharingan eye you have hidden away behind those bandages. Not to mention the Sharingan eyes you harvested from the Uchiha clan following their failed rebellion and grafted to the arm filled with Senju Hashirama's DNA. Orochimaru's own notes on the subject when I raided his base holding the documents were very precise, countered Naruto and saw Sasuke looking from him to Danzo in shock. What do you mean he took the eyes from my clan? What failed rebellion? My clan was massacred by Itachi to test his power. Exclaimed Sasuke while Naruto kept on smirking. You mean he didn't tell you? Ha. Huh. That's rich. After all these years of being loyal to this village, the truth about your clan planning a coup was still kept from you. Judging from the looks on the other clan heads and the seething faces of the shinobi elders, I see a lot of things were kept hidden. Not surprising, since those who knew of the coup also were the ones who gave the order to Itachi to kill his clan to prevent the coup from weakening Konoha in what they feared would be a civil war answered Naruto with Sasuke looking at Danzo with rage in his eyes. And the part about harvesting my clan's eyes? Demanded Sasuke while Danzo glaring at Naruto. Silence him, ordered Danzo to his root nin. Only for three of them to fall down dead by Hinata's hands via gentle fist hitting vital areas of the body. The other three lost their heads with a single swing of Naruto's sword blazing with fire coming into existence. It can't be. The legendary Uzumaki clan blade thought lost during the fall of Uzu. The legendary Crimson Murasama thought Jiraiya in fear since he knew from past history books with the Uzumaki clan in them that only an Uzumaki clan head could wield such a sword. And sword chose who was worthy. Not the other way around. Sorry, but I don't like being interrupted when I am telling certain people a painful truth that needs to be told. Now where was I? Oh yes, the harvesting of the Sharingan eyes from Sasuke Tem's backstabbing clan. 
After Itachi carried out the order to kill everyone in his clan, except for the emo currently seething in anger over here, Danzo had his root agent swoop in to take the eyes out of all the corpses while they were still fresh. Why? Because Danzo theorized that in using the Sharingan, mixed with the Mokuten of the Senju DNA of Hashirama, he could effectively use powers to boo even to the Uchiha, and even control a Biju or a Jinchuriki should one ever cross his path. Namely me, replied Naruto while seeing Danzo tighten his grip on the cane he was holding. Naruto stop this. You go too far. Protested Hiruzen while Naruto's smirk left him and turned into a scowl with the coldness being aimed at the former Hokage. Do not speak to me about going too far old man. You are no better than Danzo and no less guilty. Of course, what would one expect from the man who betrayed the Uzumaki clan, and left them to die at the hands of their enemies in the Second Shinobi War, said Naruto angrily while Hiruzen began to sweat a little at his words. I don't know what you are talking about Naruto, countered Hiruzen while Naruto's face became even colder. Do you, think long and hard about that answer you son of a bitch? Would I really make that accusation unless I knew without question your involvement in such a betrayal? Of Konoha selling out my clan when they needed its aid the one time out of countless others in the Second Shinobi War. The Uzumaki clan saved Konoha from being destroyed well over a hundred times in the one instant where we asked for aid. Thought you did nothing. No aid. No reinforcements. In fact, the only way that Uzu and the Uzumaki clan could have fallen was if the invading force had inside help from someone who knew the defense as well. The only people who could have done that were you, the shinobi elders, Danzo, Orochimaru, and of course, Dotyu Aero Senen, replied Naruto while glaring at now at the frightened Sanin. Me, what do you mean? asked Jiraiya while feeling that moment of dread growing with each passing second. You were in Uzu the day my mother was to leave it for Konoha. You asked for a tour of the island to inspect the Fuenjutsu there for research purposes and expand your own in the hopes of adding something similar to Konoha's walls. But in truth, you disabled quite a few of them and left with my mother for Konoha just days prior to the attack on Uzu, answered Naruto while Jiraiya began to sweat heavily now. How does he know that? There is no way he could know that. No one from Uzu is alive today to tell him that. Thought Jiraiya since the Sandame had ordered him to not only get Kashina for the transferring of Kyubi, but to ensure Uzu lost key defenses for when the enemy attacked. Come now Jiraiya. Just because Uzu fell didn't mean the Uzumaki clan fell with it. You should know better than to assume my clan would simply die out so easily after Kanaha's betrayal replied Naruto before he snapped his fingers and out of the shadows came a small army of Uzu shinobi. Some of them were already stained in blood from all the guards they had killed prior to entering the temple. They were alive. This whole time they were alive and kept themselves hidden. Thought Danzo, Jiraiya, Homura, Kaharu, Hiruzen, and everyone else who knew of the clan. It is true the clan did scatter to the winds, but that didn't mean they were few in number like Konoha assumed they would once Uzu fell. In fact, the only reason they didn't come together sooner was due to an Uzumaki clan head being around to unite them since none were worthy to be won. At least of course, until I came around to make us whole again, replied Naruto while he saw Sasuke foaming at the mouth at seeing not only him alive, but with a clan family, and love that the Uchiha himself had lost. Sasuke would deal with Danzo and his supporters later after he dealt with the commoner in front of him who dared to not only live past the time set by someone of elite blood, but to regain his family and be loved by them. It was insulting. It was unfair. Commoners do not get second chances at happiness. If you were poor, then you stayed poor. If you had no family or lost them in some form, then you don't get a second one. That was the way things were. Commoners stayed commoners. They had no business rising to an elite status. Only elites stayed as elites. That was the natural order of things. You are a loser. 
I don't care if you are from a clan. It's filled with a bunch of weaklings who couldn't defend themselves properly. Exclaimed Sasuke while Naruto laughed at him. Didn't you just hear me Sasuke? The Uzumaki clan was attacked by all of the shinobi villages. Suna, Iwa, Kumo, Kiri, and Konoha due to their backstabbing ways to allow the other four get past Uzu's defenses. Even then, the number of losses suffered by those four shinobi villages made them lose any thirst for battle. It was why Suna became allies with Konoha in the first place because the Uzumaki clan was still considered as much on paper and didn't have the strength to face its neighbor. Iwa and Kumo suffered the most from it, which was why the former wanted my mother dead, and the latter wanted to use her to make more Uzumaki clan members they could control. Kiri's own losses helped plant the seeds of how bloodline users were nothing but trouble, which only grew when Yandaimi Mizukage, and Jinchuriki was used as a puppet by the leader of the Akatsuki to start the bloodline purge. As for Konoha, they wanted to keep the Kayubi in Konoha because they knew by that point, without the fox in the village, well, they would easily be wiped out by the other Jinchuriki from the other four villages, and only an Uzumaki can hold the Kayubi within them replied Naruto while giving a smug smirk to the scowling figures who had a hand in his suffering. I do have a name you know, remarked Kurama with a growl. And you want these idiots to hear it. I thought you were picky on who knew your name, thought Naruto with Kurama growling. Point taken, replied Kurama since he was picky on who knew his name. Besides, they would never accept you having a name. They would sooner denounce it, Claiming a biju can't, won't, and don't have names, thought Naruto while seeing the biju inside of him nodding again. He's right sensei. You should have known better, remarked a man walking through the front doors of the temple wearing an Uzumaki clan style shinobi uniform. This young man had red hair. It was long, spiky, but what really got everyone's attention about this man was the dojutsu he was sporting. A dojutsu that was only the stories of legend. Stories of how only one other held such a dojutsu and that person was none other than the sage of six paths himself. The Rinnegan. And Nagato. Asked Jiraiya with the man named Nagato nodding. It's been quite a many years Jiraiya. Though quite few less for the current Hokage you serve. Remarked Nagato while Conan appeared using her usual paper based form. Conan. You're alive too? Asked Jiraiya while Conan nodded. Yes, I am. Though such a thing wouldn't have been possible if not for Yahiko. He gave his life for us after Hanzo laid a trap for us under false pretenses. With Danzo's help, replied Conan before she glared at Danzo since she remembered him well and saw the old war hawk had not changed much. What? Asked Jiraiya with Nagato raising his eyebrow. You didn't know. I find that hard to believe all things considered with your spy network feeding you and the former Hokage standing next to you information during that time. In fact, I would find it a bit disappointing in your skills as a spy master to not know about Danzo making a deal with Hanzo to help him become Hokage in the future after helping in the defeat of the Akatsuki, before the fake Madara came to corrupt us, replied Nagato with Jiraiya frowning. Fake Madara questioned Jiraiya while seeing Nagato reach into his pockets to pull out a storage scroll to unseal what was inside. The scarred face of none other than Uchiha Obito himself. Obito, what did you do to him? Demanded Kakashi while Naruto laughed at this. What we did, we did nothing, nothing. It was Obito who did everything. He survived his death all those years ago Kakashi. Believe it or not, Madara did not die at the hands of Senju Hashirama. He made everyone think and believe it in order to prepare his plan for the future. But he got old and his injuries fighting Hashirama were piling up. When Obito died in the mission your team had, Madara saved his body and brought him back to be his. Well, I guess you could say apprentice to carry on his work. After Madara did die, Obito was strong enough at the time, and went out into the world to find you. To find Rin. Let them know he was alive. 
He planned to come back to Konoha to tell them what happened and hoped to be welcomed with open arms. The only problem with that was when he finally found you and Rin, he saw you had driven your prized assassination jutsu through her chest, replied Naruto since he made sure to disable Obito's powers before he made the Uchiha confess everything since Madara saved his life. H he saw that, asked Kakashi in horror since he didn't want to do it, but had no choice in the matter. Rin had been turned into a Jinchuriki with an unstable seal. He had no choice, but to kill her in order to save Konoha. Yes he did. Your former teammate went psycho because of it. He realized the only way to see Rin again was under a powerful genjutsu his Sharingan has with the Sukuyomi, but on grander scale. Using the nine biju sealed into one entity that was the Jubi, which the Sage of Sixth Paths once fought, he would possess the beast, its power, and use the genjutsu on the moon to create the infinite Tsukuyomi, so everyone would be affected by it. With him in control, everything would be as he wanted it, and Obito would have his precious Rin back. Even if the girl herself was just a fake illusion formed from his own mind, answered Naruto while Kakashi had no idea that would happen thanks to his actions. I, I made Obito go insane, thought Kakashi in horror at the realization. So the man set things into motion. First, he made the Mizukage, and Jinchuriki Yagura become his puppet before ordering the man to have a bloodline purge. Of course, he did need some form of justification for the move, or else the Mizukage's actions would look weird to people both inside and outside of Kiri. Hence why he influenced the Kagaya clan with his Sharingan to make them give in to their bloodlust. After attacking Kiri, the people within the village would support such a move made by the Mizukage. At the same time, Obito knew the people with bloodlines would either die, flee, or fight back against Yagura. The latter of the three would further weaken Kiri further in the process when it was over so no one with bloodlines there could oppose the Sharingan or possible oppose him. Since Kiri turned Rin into an unstable Jinchuriki, he felt it was only fitting to use it against them. I imagine he took their actions against her personally. Though your actions didn't help much either, replied Naruto coldly at the end. I didn't want to kill Rin. She was my teammate. My friend, you said it yourself. She had become a Jinchuriki of the three tails and her seal used was unstable. It was the only way to save Konoha. To save her, said Kakashi while whispering the last part. Don't feed me that crap Kakashi. Konoha had three skilled seal masters at the time of the incident. Aero Senen, my father, and my mother. Either one of them could have fixed the seal to prevent her from being turned into a ticking time bomb. Not to mention my mother had her chakra chained so even if the biju got out, the three tails could have been restrained from causing additional damage like Kiri wanted, said Naruto while Kakashi winced since he realized his actions had been the easy way out and didn't think things through at the time. He's right. I acted irrationally. I could have hurried Rin over to Minato or Kashina if I wanted and they could have fixed the seal to keep her from dying. I was a fool, thought Kakashi while the guilt of that moment only increased. He knows about his parents. How? Who told him? Did the Uzumaki clan? Thought Danzo, Hiruzen, Homura, and Kaharu while discreetly glancing at the other Uzumaki clan members. After I killed Obito, I decided Nagato here deserved a second chance at life since Danzo nearly ruined it from the start, and my cousin was reduced to being crippled with puppets being his means of using his power. Fortunately, I had found yet another Uzumaki clan member named Karen, who was once with Orochimaru of all people for a time as his subordinate, and with special healing abilities she possessed I was able to have her heal him, replied Naruto before he refocused on Sasuke. If you think I will be intimated by your clan, then you are mistaken demon filth. Look around us. Do you really think these other shinobi villages will tolerate your clan being here? They easily will side with Konoha and do what they tried to do during the second shinobi war by ending the Uzumaki clan once and for all. 
said Danzo while glaring at the Kayubi Jinchuriki. Oh really? Tell me Suchikage-sama, will you side with Konoha if we choose to get violent here today? Questioned Naruto while the old cage grunted from his position and surprised Danzo by glaring at him. Never. I know it was him and his root filth that tried to kidnap my granddaughter last year so she could be used as a breeding factory in secret. Even worse, he planned to have the Uchiha brat here be among the ones to violate her in the hopes that she would one day give Konoha a strong child through their combined genetics. Replied the Suchikage in anger while his granddaughter glared at the Uchiha. Yes I know. I tipped you off about that. And I was the one who helped kill half of those root nin while your granddaughter did the rest. I trust that makes things even between Iwa and my family on my father's side. Said Naruto with the Suchikage nodding since he knew that while Iwa still had some bad blood against the Yondaimi Hokage, his son had basically cleared the slate by stopping Konoha from succeeding in such a vile act. So what? Iwa is weak. We still have Kumo, countered Danzo with Naruto smirking. If the Sandame Rakage was still in power, you might be right about that. But the man over there is not the Sandame Rakage. He is the Yondaimi Rakage and his brother also happens to be the eight-tailed Jinchuriki on his right and there is still the Niyugido on his left who is the two-tailed Jinchuriki. Also, I made Kumo aware that it was because of you that Konoha accused their village of stealing Hinata that night, answered Naruto while Danzo now began to sweat at that while Hiyashi looked confused and Hinata looked shocked. What do you mean? Of course Kumo did it. I killed the head ninja ambassador myself that night while he held the back holding Hinata. Protested Hiyashi while Naruto nodding that much was true. Yes, the head ninja ambassador from Kumo did steal Hinata-chan that night. But he did not do it under the orders of Kumo in any shape or form. He did it, because Danzo ordered him to do it. You see, that man was not a real Kumo shinobi. He was a root nin spying for Danzo to find out the identities of other Jinchuriki and Kumo. Danzo didn't want just one powerful biju or Jinchuriki in Konoha. He wanted as many of us as possible to be brought back to fight for this village's violent weapons of war under his command. But unlike myself and the Mazukage, the other villages kept theirs a secret for security reasons. The head ninja was in fact his spy to find them in Kumo but the Yondaimi Rakage had appointed the man as the ambassador to broker the desired peace treaty with Konoha before he could find out. To that end, Danzo decided to create a certain situation we are all familiar with. Only his plan involved the aftermath of the incident being very much different, where Kumo would have to give Konoha at least one of their Jinchuriki as reparations for violating the peace treaty signed that very night, answered Naruto while Hiyashi glared at Danzo for this since it cost him his twin brother and gained him the scorn of his nephew Neji in the process. That's why he was able to get so far with Hinata when I saw him that night, whispered Hiyashi with Naruto nodding. What Danzo didn't suspect was a certain blonde-haired boy, who had been kicked out of the orphanage that very night spiking his chakra in anger. That chakra spike easily told you something was off because it was so close to your clan home. After that, well you all know the rest. The head ninja ambassador was killed by a citizen of Konoha. Kumo had perfect deniability on their end since no one gave the order to him. There was no true way to prove the man did what Konoha accused him of doing for Kumo since instant death by gentle fist basically wiped out his mind so a Yamanaka couldn't find actually anything in his head that would be called incriminating. Not that it mattered since I suspect Danzo would have had won his root nin from the Yamanaka clan do the scan to not only wipe out his own involvement but plant false proof to get what he wanted from Kumo for when he planned to have the man captured, for interrogation, said Naruto while Hiyashi felt like he was going to have a heart attack. My own family, my brother, used like pawns for a nefarious scheme and all for a plan I never thought would happen within this village. I'm truly sorry Hazashi. 
You may have been the second born between us, but you were far more worthy of being clan head than I, thought Hiyashi while tears now descended from his eyes and it shocked Neji currently standing beside his uncle. It was basically Kanaha's word against Kumo's and at the time, the latter had the upper hand in terms of muscle to fight the former. Not surprising since Kumo had two well-trained Jinchuriki from against one from Konoha that did not appreciate him and was too young to fight back. So Hiruzen did the only thing he could do in this situation to show his village was the better one in a moral sense, if you will. He decided to bend the knee like a good little politician and offered Hayuga Hiyashi up as a peace offering. The man didn't even consider the idea of any other form of appeasement. Just sacrifice the Hyuga clan head and be done with it. Like ripping off a bandage and throw the bandage away in the trash. What no one outside of those who were part of the conspiracy on Kanaha's side realized was his twin brother, Hyuga Hazashi had the cage bird seal, and took Hiyashi's place. Also there would be peace between the two villages and to ensure Kumo still could not get the Bayakugan, thus protect the Hyuga clan. Now there was a brave man worthy of being Hokage. Because unlike the former Sandame and Danzo here, that man chose to make the sacrificial play for the good of all so everyone else could live, said Naruto while Danzo grit his teeth since he recalled how his plan failed because of what Hiyashi did. Though he had no idea Naruto had accidentally participated in the event. Kumo wanted peace with Konoha. When we heard that Konoha had killed my chosen ambassador in the middle of the night and even accusing him of kidnapping the Hyuga heiress, I demanded justice. Justice for the life they had taken, justice for the lie they were telling, and justice for violating a peace treaty so soon after it had been signed. Of course, had I known the ambassador I sent was in fact a root nin spy, I would have spit on his grave and destroyed the grave marker, said a while he glared at Danzo for his actions that nearly brought about a war between the two villages. As for Suna, I doubt the current case cage will side with you Danzo. After all, Gara is not only a fellow Jinchuriki, but a dear friend of mine, and I fixed his seal so it wouldn't cause him insomnia problems. Not to mention it was because myself and my clan's own advice to him that he is on good terms with his siblings. Even his former Junin sensei is his most trusted advisor, said Naruto while Gara nodded and the Uzumaki clan head knew he had the support of Suna in this matter. This can't be happening, thought Danzo while wondering why there weren't more of his root coming out of the shadows to protect him. Kiri won't fight for you here either because of what one member of the Uchiha clan did to their previous Mizukage and the fact you exploited those with bloodlines running away from the civil war. How you captured so many refugees, taking them underneath Konoha to be conditioned as root nins or for breeding purposes. You even provided intel to one side or the other to keep the civil war in Kiri from ending too soon Danzo, added Naruto while smirking at the current look on Danzo's face telling him that the old war hawk was no doubt thinking. No doubt wondering where his precious root nin in the shadows were and why they weren't here to help him. Damn it. How does he know this? And where are my root? Thought Danzo while he glanced at the shadows for his forces. And found nothing. Where were they? If you think I would fight for such an ugly man like you Danzo, then your eyesight has clearly aged with the rest of your body, remarked Turumi Mei while her eyes gleamed with bloodlust at the old war hawk. See Danzo. You are alone. You have nothing. No one will save you now, remarked Naruto in cold tone. You forget boy that I am the Hokage and is such a I command every ninja in this village whether they like it or not. I outnumber you with my forces in this room regardless if the cages here don't fight for me, remarked Danzo while Naruto chuckled at his choice of words in saying the other cages would fight for him and not beside him in this matter. Ah yes. Now on to the fact that your root nin who were hiding in the shadows of this place have not shown up to come to your defense. What many in this room don't know, is that Danzo had an army of root nin hidden in the shadows of this place. 
Also he could give the order to massacre every important person not from Konoha once the wedding was over. All in the name of the greater good, when in fact, it would just be for Donzo's benefit. To use the ensuing chaos of all four villages being leaderless so he could order his forces to take out the other shinobi villages. Also he could claim the spoils of war for himself. Not Konoha. Himself. So he could write the history books of Konoha with their blood and call himself the greatest Hokage ever due to his schemes ending the other four major shinobi villages. Something I made sure each cage here with the exception of Danzo, for obvious reasons, were aware of before coming here, explained Naruto while Danzo's face went as pale as Orochimaru's at being caught with his secret plot exposed. This can't be happening. Thought Danzo while seeing many of the shinobi from the other four villages stand up and reveal their hidden weapons while glaring at the war hawk. As for those hiding in the shadows, I politely asked the lovely Mizukage here if I could borrow one if not two of her Kiri shinobi. She was most generous when I asked for two of them specifically, added Naruto while giving Sasuke and Kakashi a knowing look, but the two were still in the dark about his words. Flatterer. If only you weren't taken with the Hyuga and I wasn't now married to my own man. What a husband you would have made me, thought Mei while glancing at Naruto and at the Hyuga girl. Well what did you expect Gaki? One doesn't say no to the Crimson Uzu and walk away without some kind of injury, remarked a familiar voice that Kakashi knew all too well and saw Zabuza appear from the shadows of the ceiling above with a familiar masked hunter Nin by his side. Zabuza, and, Haku, exclaimed Kakashi while Zabuza grinned behind his bandages. That's right, I got to say Kakashi, you bet on the wrong horse when it came to seeing who had the greatest potential in your genin team. The pink-haired one had no business being a genin. The Uchiha was a power-hungry idiot like the rest of his clan. As for the blonde here, let's just say if I had known of his potential all those years ago, I would have tried to recruit, and trained him to be an unstoppable juggernaut, replied Zabuza with a chuckle and gave Naruto a small salute while Haku gave a nod. He really did owe the kid. Not only did the brat become a strong shinobi, he helped with his clan take down Yagura, and reveal the man was not the monster everyone thought him to be when ruling over Kiri. Yagura was still alive, living in seclusion away from all of this as he had been racked with guilt over the issue, and wanted to live a life away from the bloodshed and violence. Zabuza met him after Mei had become Mizukage and stabilized Kiri enough that he could meet the woman's predecessor. It was clear to the demon of the mist that Yagura would be filled with shame and regret for the rest of his life, even if the Jinchuriki wasn't in his right mind thanks to the Sharingan. It was enough punishment in Zabaza's mind when meeting the man to discuss his past as the Mizukage of Kiri and the horror he had unleashed as a puppet ruler. As far as either man was concerned, the psycho that was the Yandaimi Mizukage was dead. As far as the world was concerned, the evil tyrant Yagura was dead, and the man had no intention of returning unless absolutely necessary to prevent some kind of end of the world moment in time. Which brings us back to the Uchiha and all those who had a hand in the suffering of others inside and outside of its walls in the pursuit of power, remarked Naruto while he grinned deviously at Sasuke. It doesn't matter who is on your side loser. I am an Uchiha, an elite. I am Kami's gift to these people. I am the reason these pathetic weaklings live and I have the power to make them all die exclaimed Sasuke with his anger clearly reaching or rather breaching the realm of insanity. Oh really? Because you didn't make me die the last time we saw each other Sasuke. Oh and unlike last time, I have no intention of being your pawn, shield, or sacrifice to pull off a win, taunted Naruto while Sasuke grit his teeth and tried to form another Chidori with his other arm. This time I will kill you. I will do it in front of the Hyuga bitch here. All she did when everyone believed you were dead was hurt anyone bad mouthing your memory. This insufferable woman truly loves you. Everyone knew it, 
Everyone thought it was funny how the one stupid girl in this whole stupid village actually liked the stupidest person in it. Exclaimed Sasuke with insanity in his eyes when talking. I know Sasuke. I am well aware of Hinata-chan's feelings. Thanks to my clan, I saw how much of an idiot I was for not seeing it. Shame it couldn't be said about you and Sakura. Though I doubt you cared about her despite knowing the Banshee's feelings towards you being on a fanatical level. I mean given how she was nothing more than a Uchiha loving slut, who would spread her legs for you if asked isn't much of a comparison to Hinata-chan, remarked Naruto while Sasuke's eyes narrowed before they widened in realization at what he was referring to about Sakura. It was you. You killed Sakura, exclaimed Sasuke while Naruto smirked at him. Yes I did. What's your point? I thought you didn't like her. Asked Naruto casually while he saw many were shocked the blonde had in fact killed his own former teammate. I didn't like her. She was a useless fan girl, who only got promoted to Chunin due to her book smarts and taking a written test. But I never thought you of all people would kill her given your crush on Sakura, replied Sasuke while Naruto shrugged. What can I say? The bitch wasn't my type. At the same time, I wanted to see just how far lost she truly was in terms of being my teammate and as a friend. She didn't know who I was at first, meeting me on her mission and thought I was a harmless wanderer. The girl never even considered I could be someone important, high standing, or even a dangerous missing nin. Our so-called sensei really dropped the ball when it came to training her to look underneath the underneath. Though what would expect when he spent most of his time training a brooding emo determined to avenge his clan. Anyway, when I finally did mention myself in third person in an offhanded way, I saw Sakura's true colors, and they were not pretty in the slightest. She went on and on about me being a loser. How she was glad I was dead so she didn't have to deal with my annoying self, as Sakura put it. How she could spend her time focusing on how to get your affection while not having to deal with mine. How to one day make you finally confess your love for her and settle down to form a family together. How her only regret was not having helped you in killing me in order to form that special bond lovers need to really connect with one another explained Naruto while seeing not many of those in the room were shocked that Sakura said those things about him. It clearly meant that day wasn't the first time she said those things in front of other people when Naruto was mentioned around her. So you killed her. Out of what? Anger. Spite. Knowing she had wanted me and would never love you. Demanded Sasuke while his Chidori was ready to be launched from his remaining working hand. Please. I killed her because she was a bitch. A loyal lapdog of the people in this village, who would sooner spit on my father's sacrifice to save them all from death, than even make the effort in getting to know me. They didn't care about my father or my mother. It didn't matter he was the Hokage and she was his wife. All that mattered to them was that someone suffered and they chose me. Even some of these people knew who my parents were, but did they care? No. Just as they don't really care about you Sasuke. You think these people care about you being an Uchiha. Ha. Huh. They only care about your eyes and the ability to help make more Uchiha babies. Take that away and what do the people see? A pathetic waste of space they would sooner walk over or step on if it meant getting to their next destination in life. You don't matter Sasuke. Only your bloodline in Dojutsu do, replied Naruto while Sasuke looked livid. It doesn't matter. When I'm Hokage, I will make everyone understand what it means to cross me, or make themselves believe they are my equal. I will see to it that everything and everyone is controlled by the Uchiha clan. Finances, Jutsus, the people whether they are civilians, shinobi, or those from clans. Even the bloodlines themselves will be the property of the Uchiha clan. Exclaimed Sasuke before charging forward to end Naruto's life. Still thinking with all the muscles except the one that counts and even then. Dot it's decayed to the point of being useless even if he used it. 
thought Naruto before moving faster than anyone thought possible in a crimson flash before appearing behind the Uchiha. And within mere moments, Dot saw Uchiha Sasuke becoming bloody meat chunks falling to the ground. He just killed Sasuke like it was nothing. Thought everyone who didn't know the extent of Naruto's skills. That everyone, is how you deal with those who spread the curse of hatred to others around them. You don't tolerate them. You don't embrace them in friendship in hopes that it will make them grow some kind of conscious and stop being evil. You don't spoil them with countless offerings of money, jutsus, and promises of being in a position of power. You kill them. That is what you do. You stamp it out by putting your foot to their throat and make it go crunch. Exclaimed Naruto while glaring at Danzo now, knowing full well the man not only protected the curse of hatred in Sasuke, but encouraged the curse of hatred to spread throughout the village to use as a tool and a weapon for his own schemes. And he wasn't alone in that regard either. Naruto stop this. You've made your point. There is no need for further bloodshed, said Hiruzen in order to appeal to the boy he once knew. That is where you are wrong old monkey. You see this village owes the Uzumaki clan, myself, and every village here a big fat debt. A debt that will be paid in blood and with the lives of those who demand it be paid in full. Fortunately, a good chunk of the people who owe us this massive debt are all here in this temple where this unholy wedding was to take place, replied Naruto while Hiruzen began to sweat heavily. For someone who says we should stamp out the curse of hatred, you are embracing it quite well Gaki. I didn't think you would be a hypocrite of all things. Your parents would be ashamed of you. Protested Jiraiya while Naruto laughed. Really? This coming from the man who forsook his own godson. Who left him to the whims and machinations of the village that hated him. Of course, what would I expect from a man, who betrayed his own teammate years ago by having her lover Dan, and her brother Nawaki killed, replied Naruto with Jiraiya jerking his head back like he had been hit. W what? Asked Jiraiya nervously. Come now Jiraiya. Don't deny it. We both know you and Danzo each had a hand in the death of those two. Dan's mission at the time was top secret. Few knew about it, yet he was ambushed all the same by enemy shinobi in the end. How do you think that could have happened? It couldn't have happened, unless someone on the inside made it happen so Tsunade wouldn't marry Dan in the future. That someone was you Jiraiya, replied Naruto with Jiraiya sputtering some kind of excuse. You have no proof. Jiraiya eventually protested. Now you see, that is where you are wrong. After I helped out the Suchikage with the issue surrounding his granddaughter, he decided to give me some information about that moment in time. You see, Iwa Shinobi were indeed the ones responsible for killing Dan during that secret mission, but they would have never known about him actually being a Konoha Shinobi had they not been tipped off by one of your spies from your network. Your spy tipped them off on your orders Jiraiya. I have seen the proof myself. Not in just so you know, Tsunade and Shizune have too, replied Naruto with Jiraiya going pale in the face to the point where he could have been mistaken for Orochimaru. They know, whispered Jiraiya fearfully. I also know it was through your spy network and Donzo's machination that her brother, Senju Nawaki died during his mission too. Though why you got involved in that mess is a bit of a puzzle since you gain nothing from the boy's death. So why help Danzo kill the boy in the first place? Questioned Naruto with Jiraiya glancing at Danzo. I helped because the bloodline limit of the Senju was dying out. Tsunade couldn't use it and Nawaki was questionable at best. They were the last two Senju in existence without the Mokuten bloodline to back it up. Orochimaru and Danzo approached me and Hiruzen about the possibility of keeping the Mokuten alive through those outside of the clan via human experimentation. Basically, blood splicing Senju blood with other people to give them the ability to produce the Mokuten that Hashirama could use, if not the Sweden skills Toborama himself had. We had some of Hashirama's blood and cells on file for possible use but they were old, and slightly decayed from being in the cold storage unit for so long. 
Orochimaru theorized we could rejuvenate them if mixed with blood of someone who was a direct descendant of his line. Nawaki was the only option since test showed Tsunade's ability to use it was dormant as a recessive trait. By mixing the power behind the old blood of Hashirama with the new blood of his grandson Nawaki, Orochimaru believed we could bring about the maximum potential for the Mokuten to come out in a test subject, replied Jiraiya while Naruto shook his head. And in all the illegal experiments done to people, only one person survived the process in using the Mokuten. Even then, it was a shadow of what Hashirama himself could have done at his weakest. All he could do was the standard Mokuten. He didn't even have the ability to suppress a biju like Hashirama could with his own bloodline, remarked Naruto while Jiraiya flinched. I know, and I'm sorry, replied Jiraiya before killer intent shot down at him from above and he slowly, if not fearfully, looked up. Sorry, you're sorry, clearly you're not sorry enough, exclaimed Tsunade, who had leapt from her position above having heard everything, and descended down on Jiraiya. Oh shit, whispered Jiraiya while seeing an angry Tsunade in full-fledged Uzumaki clan ninja gear heading his way. And tore right into him with a single punch with the toad sage's body exploding when Tsunade made contact with his form. Blood, guts, bone, and flesh exploded everywhere while those around the impact zone were sent flying in the process. No one from Konoha could move, much less process in their minds what just happened, and those that could were actually quite scared. Tsunade, stop this madness. You are a senju. Your grandfather and granduncle would not have wanted this, protested Hiruzen before he was grabbed by the woman and came face to face with her blood-soaked form. My family on both sides have been bled dry by this village. The Senju and the Uzumaki clans were always the first to defend Konoha and the last to gain anything in return from it. We didn't mind it since we loved this village and we were proud to fight for it. But we also expected that such loyalty and love would be returned by those we gave it to in the process. Give and take Sensei. You didn't give it back. You just took it and never once tried to return it. Exclaimed Tsunade angrily at him. I know. I was jealous. Jealous of the Senju and Uzumaki clan. All that power. All those skills I could never hope to achieve. All within clans greater than mine. I was constantly in the shadow of both and I couldn't get around it. When the opportunity came to weaken or remove either clan from the history books and memories of the next generation. I took it, confessed Hiruzen while Tsunade looked even angrier. Yet you kept the Uchiha clan around. The traitors and usurpers of life itself. Exclaimed Tsunade with Hiruzen wincing. They were next. Your granduncle planted the seeds of distrust years ago when he was the Hokage. Danzo and I merely allowed it to grow. After the Kaiubi attack, many were easily convinced someone from the Uchiha clan had something to do with it. Eventually, the Uchiha clan could not take all the resentment the village was actually showing them, and planned a coup against the village to take control. We used it as an excuse to use one of their own to spy and eventually kill off the clan to leave a single remaining survivor in the form of Uchiha Sasuke. We decided to keep the Uchiha clan alive because of their eyes being capable of controlling the biju and the bloodline itself was more reliable in awakening than the Mokuten or the chakra chains some of the Uzumaki clan possessed, replied Hiruzen while his conspirators on the issue scowled at him for confessing this to Tsunade. And mold them into a clan you could control without them even knowing it. Inflate their ego make them loved, and important all the while using it as a means to manipulate them into being your puppets, concluded Tsunade with Hiruzen nodding. Yes, was Hiruzen's simple reply. To think at one point I admired you. That at one point, I saw you as a second father to me when mine died. Now I see that you as just a crippled old man with delusions of grandeur, said Tsunade before she ripped the old man's heart right out and crushed it in her hands. Tsunade, you had no right to do that to Hiruzen, protested Kaharu angrily. Actually, we have every right. 
which is why I think it's only fair, given Kanaha's own version of providing us with such generous hospitality today at this wedding, that we in turn, give it back. Replied Naruto before snapping his fingers with the sound echoing throughout the temple. And it was in that moment, that all hell broke loose. Ninja from the other four shinobi villages, the Uzumaki clan, Hanada, and Naruto soon moved as a single entity. The remaining root nin around Danzo were killed, Homura and Kaharu were slain by Konan, and Nagato basically tore into anyone from Konoha that got in his way. Hanada herself had killed the fire monk when he tried to move to attack Naruto while Naruto himself cut through the entire civilian council trying to flee for their miserable lives. In fact, many of the people from Konoha, who were slain in the temple, and not subdued were in fact those who supported the actions of its leaders. The rookies nor their senseis were killed though since Naruto didn't want all of Konoha to die simply because of the actions of a few in high places. That would be wrong. That would allow for the curse of hatred to live on in themselves and be hypocrites. Konoha could still be a great shinobi village again, but only after being properly trimmed of the poisonous branches and roots responsible for its decaying presence in the world. Besides, Naruto was confident Konohamaru would make a great Hokage one day. The boy had grown up over the years to be a competent ninja since they last saw each other when Naruto himself was just a 12-year-old fresh out of the academy. In time, the boy would get out of his grandfather's vile shadow, and be a true Hokage like he wanted to be from the start. When it was all over, many from Konoha were dead within the temple currently stained red with blood. Those that were not killed, were handpicked by Naruto to be captured, restrained, and let their fate be decided later on. But for the most part, they had nothing to worry about since the ones Naruto wanted killed were the mindless, arrogant pricks in the village, and the officials who were allowing corrupt things to happen in it. The only one not accounted among the dead or captured, that was Danzo. I sense him, he won't get far, remarked Nagato before he, Konan, Hanada, and Naruto went to pursue the man. Are you sure you want to ruin your wedding dress in this fight Hanada-chan? I mean it's already ruined with being torn up and covered in blood, but still, do you want to make it worse? It actually looked good on you, when it was whole questioned Naruto while he saw Hanada's wedding dress had seen better days and yet despite the garment being put in the state it was in now, that she still looked sexy. That man used my clan for his own ambitions Naruto-kun. He wanted to use you as a weapon of war. I lost my uncle thanks to his machinations. The man deserves to die. Stated Hanada while Naruto whistled at her words. Damn. You sound so fierce right now Hanada-chan. It's such a turn on, remarked Naruto while Hanada blushed a nice shade of red. D don't say things like that. I'm somewhat mad at you for making me think you were dead all this time, replied Hanada while trying to be angry, but found herself unable to be when it came to him. Damn his charming smile. Hey, you two can catch up and be all lovey devay later. We have an old war hawk to kill. Make out time comes about after he's dead, commented Nagato with Naruto and Hinata blushing. Oh like you were one to talk. I seem to recall you and Conan getting all lovey devey in the afternoon just yesterday, countered Naruto with Nagato and Conan now blushing at the fact they were caught like that. I told you someone was watching us, whispered Conan while red faced and giving Nagato a, I told you so, mixed with a, you are making this up to me later glare. Sorry, whispered Nagato before they found Danzo trying to run through the streets of Konoha and trying to free his hidden limb. Not easy when you are a very old man with a cane and chakra doing only so much to help lighten the load of being elderly. Going somewhere Danzo, I thought a Hokage was supposed to stand and fight against all odds for the good of Konoha. Questioned Naruto in a taunting manner. Hardly. The Hokage is the most valuable person in all of Konoha. Only the Hokage can run the village and therefore the Hokage must never fight unless absolutely necessary. In fact, 
It is the duty of every shinobi in the village to defend him with their lives, and give them when necessary to ensure the life of the Hokage is never taken, replied Danzo while freeing his arm Orochimaru created for him. Damn that thing is fucking ugly, commented Nagato at seeing the deformed arm with all of those Sharingan eyes grafted into it. Bullshit. If what you say is true, then why usurp those who came before you as Hokage? Why usurp the Sandame, or my father the Yondaimi Hokage? Don't bother denying it Danzo. I know you tried to gain power in secret during both their times as Hokage. You even did it during the time when the Nadaim Hokage was still alive, countered Naruto while Danzo scowled further. Because none of them were worthy of being the Hokage. I was the only one. Me. Those fools wanted the love of the people in order to unite them. Instead, they should have just forced them to obey rather than asking, and use their superior skills to enforce it. Such weak emotional sentiment toward people make ninja weak, exclaimed Danzo while he ripped off the bandage on his face to reveal his Sharingan eye. For an old man, you sure do sound like a whiny little child seeing every other child get the one toy you want, but you yourself can't have. And to make matters worse, you even decide to make everyone else who does have said toy very miserable, remarked Nagata while Danzo glared at him. I don't have to justify myself to you or the Uzumaki clan, replied Danzo while Naruto just smirked. I don't expect you to justify it Danzo. You have nothing on hand to possibly justify your past actions. You can claim to be a patriot of Konoha all you want. But we know for a fact, you did all the things you did for yourself. Not Konoha. Just you. You sacrificed everyone and everything around you carelessly just to stay alive a little bit longer. But what happens when there is nothing on your side left to sacrifice, dot but yourself? What will you do then Danzo? Questioned Naruto while Danzo started to build up his chakra to use his various Mokuden jutsus taken from the Senju clan in order to combat them. Only to find his, enhanced, arm to be hit all over with Senban needles and what looked like Kanai made of bone. Sorry I was late Naruto-sama. I was delayed by the remaining detachment of Root Nin you ordered me to kill, said Kimimaro while Haku appeared beside him as well. Nonsense Kimimaro. You were right on time. Same with you Haku. Good job with the use of your deadly precision with the needles and bone kanai on your part. As always, it is most impressive, replied Naruto with both bowing slightly at his praise. My Sharingan eyes. Each one on my arm was hit. I can't use the Mokuden Jutsus or the Azanagi if they hit me with a lethal attack. Thought Danzo before turning to see Naruto walking toward him. I would have let Nagato and Konan kill you for what was done to them, but something tells me if we drag this out, you'll do something dangerous and desperate to kill us all. So I'm going to end this quickly so your backup plan doesn't even have a small percentage of success. Remarked Naruto while sword in its sheath seemed to glow like it was eager to kill its intended target. You won't get the chance to stop me. I won't allow you to outlive me in this world. I am its one true god. I was meant to live forever and rule over everyone around me. Not you. Not the Yandaimi. Not the Sandame. Not Orochimaru or the Akatsuki. I was going to be this world's savior exclaimed Danzo with the madness in his eyes clearly showing while exposing his chest for the seal on it to appear. Well will you look at that, the old man does have emotions after all. I owe Naruto some money. Damn, remarked Nagato with a smirk. A savior saves the world from destruction Danzo. They don't enslave it like you wanted to do. Your description of yourself in more along the lines of that of a tyrant, whispered Naruto before he moved too fast for Danzo's remaining Sharingan eye to track. Almost a second later, Naruto shot his sword out of his sheath, and cut right through the war hawk in two horizontally right down the middle where the complex seal on his body was located. Danzo sputtered out a gurgled curse at the blonde as he fell backwards, his wounds already cauterizing after being sliced open by the heat from the blade. 
He also felt both of his arms had also been taken off at the elbow and could barely even look up from his down position on the ground. You stupid brat. Don't you get it? The world will not stop fighting unless a central force or entity is the one controlling the rest of the world. Konoha was going to be that central force. That entity. Without the other shinobi villages to stop us, we could have moved into an era of controlled peace. We could have kept all the future wars this world went through small and controllable, but still necessary to advance ourselves from becoming stagnant. Without someone like me in charge of this village, this world will continue to fall into chaos and will only get worse as time goes by. Stated Danzo while seeing his enemies surround him. If that were true Danzo, you wouldn't have caused so much pain and hardship for the rest of the world. You wouldn't have kidnapped children to turn into emotionless root pawns. You wouldn't have manipulated Hanzo to betray the Akatsuki when they could have had peace and united together to end the fighting around AIM. You wouldn't have allied with Orochimaru and acquired this blood-spliced abomination for an arm meant to subdue Jinchuriki and Biju alike. You didn't want to save the world from itself Danzo. You tried to enslave it. You tried to control it. You wanted to be this world's god and rule over all with an emotionless attachment to it. Also any action done, good or ill to the people, would be felt without an ounce of guilt. You wanted to become a true god, which is why you spent so much time watching, spying, and monitoring the actions of those already pursing different forms of immortality. When the time was right, you could swoop in later to claim the one that fit you best. Until then, you were simply content to let yourself have, demi-god, powers of sorts with all these Sharingan eyes, and send you DNA to cheat death, explained Naruto while Danzo spat out some of his blood right at the Jinchuriki's feet. I am the only one who can save this world. You have killed the one person capable of bringing about true peace. Said Danzo while his life faded away into darkness. No. I killed a tyrant who cared for nothing or no one but himself. I killed a man who was so afraid of death, he chose to go so far as to kill others in the pursuit of cheating it, and become a god in the belief gods can't die, replied Naruto with Danzo gurgling blood from his mouth. Gods, can't. Dot die, whispered Danzo before his head fell back and the man's life left his body. Actually, they do die Danzo. The main difference between us and them is they live a lot longer. It's really all about their lifespan when you get right down to it, replied Naruto before stabbing Danzo's eye holding the Sharingan before pulling the sword out. This is no Genjutsu here. This is the real body of Shimura Danzo, said Nagato with his Rinnegan active to ensure Danzo didn't try to pull a fast one on them. Agreed said Hinata while she saw the body with her Byakugan and knew there wasn't a genjutsu to deceive them. Burn the body. The last thing anyone in this world needs is for someone to come along and pick up the pieces of this filth to replicate what happened to him, replied Naruto, as he walked away from the body with Hinata beside him, and felt the heat from the fire jutsu used to burn Donzo's corpse seconds later. Who do you think will take over as Hokage once everything settles down? Asked Hinata with Naruto shrugging. Don't know. It's hard to say with so many shinobi from Konoha, who supported Danzo and his viper's nest of slime now dead. The next Hokage will have to be someone strong, yet wise enough to remove the stain of dishonor on it. Someone who won't let the seat or the hat go to their head. Regardless of whoever is chosen, I trust the next Hokage won't do anything to get revenge on us, or the other four shinobi villages, said Naruto while looking over at the Hyuga girl and smiled at her. You could do it, you could be Hokage, offered Hinata while Naruto shook his head. No, that dream was a lie. The Sandame put that lie in my head so I would stay loyal to Konoha. To strive for an impossible dream and never give up in trying to achieve it. He knew Konoha would never accept me in the village long after he died. He also knew I would never be Hokage. I secretly checked all the laws pertaining to being qualified for the position. 
The old bastard had laws put in place to deny a Jinchuriki the right to being the Hokage on ground that Jinchuriki are frontline assault units in war and a Hokage needs to be behind his shinobi to give them commands. My father had actually repealed the law when he was Hokage so my mother could apply for it in the event something happened to him during his reign. But when the Sandame came back, he reversed my father's decision and made even stricter laws surrounding it so the only way it could be repealed again was if all the council members and clan heads agreed to the repeal of the law, replied Naruto with Hinata looking at him in shock. That's horrible, said Hinata with Naruto nodding. Yeah, the law is still in effect even now. Not that it matters to me. If the next Hokage manages to reverse it, I still won't try to run for the position. I have too many duties and responsibilities as the Uzumaki clan head. I basically rule over all of Uzu now that is fully up and running, added Naruto with Hinata looking down sadly. I see. And just who is your future wife among your clan going to be? Surely there is one among them worthy of being your wife and future mother of your children. Asked Hinata while Naruto let out a nervous chuckle. Well. I will admit I did have a few offers of marriage from some of the female members of the clan. But I never accepted, replied Naruto while Hinata was surprised he didn't say yes since she was sure her crush had woman from the clan if not other places wishing to be his wife. Oh, why is that? asked Hinata curiously. Because while they were all great in terms of one day being my wife, my heart already belonged to another. You to be exact answered Naruto with Hinata looking shocked and her face going cherry red. M me, why me? asked Hinata, as she thought he was dead for four long years, and could not see why the blonde would be interested in her. Because during that time, I was raised by my clan, and they taught me many things about what to look for in terms of love. In terms of who I would want to be my future wife and helping me lead the clan. With their help, I saw Sakura for the horrible person she truly was, and looked deeper in myself for who was that special someone. Looking back on my memories, I noticed you were always following me, blushing when I looked in your direction, and realized you had a major crush on me, replied Naruto with Hinata blushing further now at being told he had been followed by her. It was so embarrassing. I'm sorry if I made myself out to be a stalker. I saw how so many people hated you and I didn't know why. The more I watched you, the more you interested me, and in a way I admired you for putting up with everyone who hated you. How you never gave up. How you kept on trying no matter how hard people knocked you down and tried to keep you down, said Hinata while looking like her former shy self now. Thanks. After all of that, I decided to do a little snooping and following you on my own to see just how you would react to my death when the village broadcast it for everyone to hear. I was, very flattered, added Naruto with Hinata blushing even further since he no doubt saw her more, violent side when regarding those who badmouthed him. They had no right to say and do all those horrible things about you, remarked Hinata while Naruto smirked. No, but it was refreshing to see that out of everyone in the village, you were among the very rare few who actually showed they gave a damn, replied Naruto before he grabbed Hinata's hand and gave it a loving squeeze. I'm not that special, whispered Hinata while Naruto gave her hand a loving squeeze a second time. Not from what I have seen. Come on, let's deal with the aftermath of this and go from there, said Naruto with the Hyuga beside him nodding. Epilogue years later, the years following the now dubbed, Crimson Wedding, Konoha had slowly, like the speed of a glacier, finally managed to show signs of being great again. It had not been easy. Nowhere near easy. The village had a major black eye after Naruto had revealed Konoha's dirty little secrets that basically made them public enemy number one for the world after all the crap done by Danzo during his time as Hokage. And not just Danzo either. But the former Sandame Hokage, Kaharu, Homura, Jiraiya, and even a few Anbu commanders they planned to carry about their orders to the letter. Fortunately, with all these individuals now dead, 
a new Hokage was now sitting in the chair and ruling over Konoha. Someone who would do things right and ensure the village would not make the same mistakes that two out of three past Hokages had done in his place. His name, Maida Guy. Yes, that Maida Guy. The same Maida Guy who goes on about the flames of youth and exercises every day to his heart's content with his, what some would call, unusual bundle of energy. At the moment, he was currently battling the one thing even his usual energy-filled self couldn't seem to combat no matter how hard the man tried. The greatest and most infamous enemy that was the bane of all cages and daimyos alike. Paperwork. Though it wasn't like Guy didn't have help. He had his old team come to help him with his duties. It had been a trying time for them, the other rookies, and their fellow senseis with the fallout of the Crimson Wedding. Serutobi Konohamaru became the man's chosen successor to the title and could be seen sitting in meetings with the man in order to watch how things were done so he could learn from him. Kakashi, for his constant failures as a junin, but as a sensei to Team 7, and of course showing favoritism by training only Sasuke, not to mention teaching him the Chidori during that time, was imprisoned within a cell in Uzu. He even had his Sharingan eye surgically removed by Tsunade before the eye itself was destroyed by Naruto himself. And he wasn't the only one. Hiyashi was sent to the prison in Uzu for his own crimes against Hinata, including his action in arranging the marriage with the Uchiha. Many within the main family weren't thrilled by this, but they had little choice regarding the issue due to Hyuga clan being in deep trouble with the Uzumaki clan. What no one outside of either the Uzumaki clan or the Hyuga clan main family knew was how the cage bird seal was formed. The Uzumaki clan had made a bloodline protection seal for the Hyuga clan ages ago long before the shinobi villages had been founded. The overall purpose of the seal was to do what the cage bird seal did, with the exception of the whole cause pain to the nerve centers of the brain to the point of frying it if kept active for too long. After the Hyuga clan had made alterations to the seal into what they used up to the very present day, despite promising not to change it, they placed the newly renamed cage bird seal on the more gullible, and naive members of the clan have it placed on them. Only to find out about the deception until it was too late and generation after generation of their side of the family within the clan being forced into enslavement in all but name. Though after Naruto brought the issue to light for Hinata, it no longer mattered anymore since he not only found a way to break the seal, but gave all of the Hyuga clan a new seal to protect their bloodline. The only difference now to back then was Naruto had set it up so the seal could only be applied on the back of the neck of the Hyuga it was placed on. He also secretly designed it with safeguards within the major complex parts of the seal itself to protect the new seal against tampering so it could not be altered by a Hyuga with delusions of enslaving certain parts of the clan again. As for the future of the Hyuga clan, it was decided that Neji being considered among the strongest of the clan would lead. Hanabi had felt conflicted due to that decision because she had been groomed to being the new clan head to succeed her father even before Hinata was arranged to marry the Uchiha. After seeing Hinata's newly found strength following the Kayubi Jinchiriki's assumed death was too much for the elders or Hiyashi to handle. Hence why they felt her being married to the Uchiha, and focusing on Hanabi being the new clan head was a safer choice to lead. But with the Hyuga elders now dead and Hiyashi now imprisoned with his own bloodline sealed within the prison of Uzu, the leader of the clan everyone now wanted was Neji. Hanabi could have challenged the boy for the right to lead the Hyuga clan, but Hanabi knew deep down that Neji was indeed the superior fighter between them, and she would ultimately lose. It was best to let the rightful person lead and help said person when needed to keep the clan strong. The shinobi villages changed their own ways too. Namely regarding their Jinchuriki and how they were treated. Kumo had of course shown their two Jinchuriki could achieve so much when loved and respected by their village. Which Naruto had pointed out happened thanks to his father mentioning it to a and to be years ago after he fought them at one point in time. 
The Uzumaki clan head even went to point out that mistreating Jinchuriki could only make things worse, as they could be ticking time bombs if hit with enough abuse that their minds snap. While he didn't want them to go so far as say spoil them or even kiss their ass needlessly, Naruto did point out that a beloved Jinchuriki brought out their full potential. Namely due to them wanting to fight to protect their home. Not to mention their loyalty to the village when the time came to defend it would be considered unquestionable. In the end, life for his Jinchuriki brothers and sisters were looking up, and Naruto couldn't be happier about it. Though B was still being a pain in the ass with his rapping. Tsunade herself never set foot in Konoha again. Neither did Shizune. They took what they wanted from the Senju clan home and moved to Uzu. It was here that Tsunade had found love again with an Uzumaki and they soon had a child together. All thanks to the help of Shizune, who volunteered to be a surrogate mother using Tsunade's eggs she had frozen in storage when hitting 30. But due to her age being well past that time, she had reached the point where having a child conceived naturally was not possible. It made Tsunade feel whole again knowing she had a child to call her own and Shizune was there to help give the child twice the motherly love. Nagato married Konan, which wasn't much of a shock, and the two had a son they named Yahiko after their dear friend from the past. It was also during this time they learned that while pain itself can bring understanding on some level, it was through love that people truly bonded together. The two promised themselves to raise the boy to grow up strong and was loved by his fellow Uzumaki clan members. As for Naruto, he handled the affairs of Uzu, and the Uzumaki clan as a whole with his new wife Uzumaki Hayuga Hanada by his side. With her own knowledge of how to run a clan, she was able to help with any additional clan-related problems that popped up. Not that there were many, but some did pop up from time to time. Namely Konoha wanting to get back in his and the Uzumaki clan's good graces by wanting the alliance the two once had together being restored. Something that was soon not going to happen anytime soon. Of course, Naruto made sure that his duties as the Uzumaki clan head didn't get in the way of him being a loving husband, and eventually a loving father after Hinata became pregnant with his child. In the end, all was right in his world. His enemies were dead, he had alliances with the other four shinobi villages, and was now a family man with his clan to support him. And to think, all it took was for some power-hungry brooding emo for an Uchiha to use him as a human shield before throwing him off the bridge to die a watery grave. Naruto almost wanted to thank Sasuke for his actions back then, if the idea of doing so wasn't so stupid in the first place. The Uchiha clan was dead. Long live the Uzumaki clan. The true heir to the will of the Sage of Six Paths in wanting peace.